Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 14. Verse 14 says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Jesus' response is very telling. It's actually a bit shocking. He turns to the crowd, probably focuses his gaze on his disciples and says, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your word. We just ask for your spirit to be felt in this place. You asked us the question, how long? We will also ask you the question, how long? How much longer? May we find answers to our questions, and may we be willing to accept the questions to our answers. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Jesus had just been transfigured. His three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, were there on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah were there with Jesus, encouraging him. And after this celestial experience, Jesus makes his way down the mountain with Peter, James, and John and sees a crowd that has surrounded the nine remaining disciples. And they're in a heated argument right now. Christ breaks it up and says, what are you arguing about? And the father of this son that has been possessed by a spirit, says, I came to you, but you were not here. Anybody ever been there in their their prayer life where you brought something before Jesus, but you do not feel that he's there? You do not hear him? You do not believe he's actually listening? The father says, I brought my son to you, but, but you were not here. But your disciples said that they could do what you do. So I asked them, Please, cast out this evil spirit so that my son may be free. They said they could do it, but they could not. Wow. They said they could do it, but they could not. Now, what's interesting is the disciples had just recently come back from tour of casting out demons and healing people. Jesus had given them power over the devil's domain. And they came back with testimonies telling Jesus of what they accomplished. So they're kind of feeling themselves a little bit when Jesus goes off to the mountain. They they don't really know what's going on, but they're like, we'll hold the fort, Jesus. Don't worry. If anybody comes searching for you, we'll take your place. We're, We're your disciples. We know how to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? We have the answer. It's us. But they could not. And, and, and Christ has a very interesting response here because I'm not used to him showing this type of frustration. Yes, there's the temple experience where he's knocking over tables and pigeons are flying and, and, and sheep and goats are scattering. and every, I, There's that moment, but that always felt like there was, that was kind of a blip on the radar. And there was that one time he was hungry and he went to a fig tree and it didn't have any figs and he cursed it, right? That was also a little bit difficult to swallow. But this one comes off like he's annoyed. It doesn't feel like righteous indignation. It just feels like he is super annoyed and says, how much longer do I have to put up with this faithless generation? Wow. Do you ever think that Jesus gets annoyed with you and your lack of faith? Is it annoying to God? I'm just wondering. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Does God get to a place with us where he has shown us so much of who he is, where we have 
countless stories of him coming through for us, and then we have these moments, and he rolls his eyes and is like, oh my, me? Oh my, me. How long do I have to put up with you? How much longer? Now, I have to be honest with you. Jesus appears to be frustrated, but may I dare say the feeling is mutual? You're upset with me because I don't seem to have enough faith, but part of the reason why I don't have as much faith is because I don't see you coming through for me. You tell me to ask and I'll receive. Knock and the door will be open. If I seek, I will find. You even give us these wonderful common sense illustrations. What father among you, if the son asked for bread, you would give him a rock? If you who are sinners, you who are evil, know how to give good things, how much more will your heavenly Father not give good things to you? Well, that makes a lot of sense. If I remain in him and he remains in me, he tells us in John 15 that I can ask for whatever I want and it will be given to me. These are not my words I'm making up. Jesus, these are your words and I'm, I'm holding you to it. So I've been in situations where I have prayed, 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 and I, I, I don't know how to muster up any more faith. I, I, I'm just telling you, Lord, I'm coming to you and I'm depending on you and I get nothing at times. So two weeks ago, I told you about my first Sabbath in Oakland, California at the Grand. And that during the fellowship meal, I was asked to go visit a home where there was a young man who was sick. I didn't know how sick he was. I just heard he was sick. And so I said, do you want me to go right now? The auntie says, no, you don't have to go right now after you're done eating. After I'm done eating, I go to the house, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it, it must have been seconds. But as soon as I walk in the door and we go into the room, the boy is no longer breathing. The mother who is there says, he was just breathing a minute ago. It's as if when she answered the door and I walked in, God decided, I'm just going to give him a test of kind of mess with him a little bit. The boy is dead. And I told you two weeks ago that I struggled. I was fearful because I didn't want to appear to be someone who did not have enough faith. But I knew the scripture very well. I knew all the stories. I knew the time when Elijah, in a similar situation, uh, prayed for a dead child to come back to life. And he got on top of the boy to keep his body warm. And, and he would not stop praying until the boy came back to life. Elisha did the same thing, following in his master's footsteps. In both situations, the boys come back to life. So I know the pressure's on. I tell everyone to clear the room. Just like Jesus had cleared the room when he brought the little girl back to life in our message two weeks ago. And it was just me and this boy who was no longer breathing. And I'm thinking to myself, if, if, if this does not work, what will they say about me in the church? I'm 26 years old, I'm young, I'm, I'm too young to even know really what is the right path. They're looking for a reason not to trust me. The conference put the pressure on me. They said, if, if you cannot grow this church, we're going to come back in two years. If it's not growing, we're going, to, we're going to put you in another church under another pastor. Or we're going to send you to Andrews to go to seminary. Both situations I did not want. The pressure was on. And I wanted to pray the prayer that we often pray. Lord, if it is your will... Let this boy come back to life. We love these prayers because it kind of takes the pressure off of us. Lord, if this is what you want, how many of us have been in a hospital room? Lord, if it's your will, uh, uh, heal this person of cancer. Lord, if it's your will, give this person back their vision. And if it doesn't happen, what do we say? It must be the Lord's will. <laughs> Hands are washed. Can't say I didn't have enough faith. We're good. But in these stories that I had been reading, I saw individuals that did not pray if it's your will. They just rolled up their sleeves and said, oh, I'm not giving up until you bless me. Abraham pleading for Sodom works him down from 50 righteous to 10. Jacob wrestles all night long. Elijah and Elisha won't leave the room until the boys come back to life. The Canaanite woman will not accept no for an answer until Jesus gives her what? He, she wants 
The Roman centurion says, don't even come by my house. Just say the word. And Christ says, I have not seen faith like this, not even in all of Israel. Then there's the parable of the, 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 the persistent widow in Luke 18, where Jesus says, always pray and never become discouraged. And she will not give up until the wicked judge gives in. And Christ says, listen to the, what the wicked judge did. Now, will God not give in to his people whom he loves? So I said, Lord, this can't just be about your will right now. It's about faith and what we want. And I'm telling you, in this moment, it felt too big. But it was me in the room with this boy, and I begin to pray. Lord, I know you can do this. I know this is not too big for you. I know that right now, it's as simple as you simply saying the word. This is a monumental moment. As I begin my ministry here in Oakland, Lord, show yourself. May your mighty hand be felt in this place. May this church know that you're alive, that you're real, and that you listen to your people. And may it become well known throughout the city of Oakland. And then I had this thought in my head, how long do I stay in this room and fight with God? Am I willing to pull an all-nighter like Elijah? Am I willing to pull an all-nighter like Jacob? How long? How long? And what if after wrestling all night long, God says no? You see, Jesus might ask the question, how much longer? But in my life, I've had to ask the same questions of him. How much longer? It shouldn't be that difficult. You either love us or you don't. You either care or you don't. You're either for us or you're not. But this waiting game has to stop. How much longer? I'm asking you, Jesus, how much longer? Back in verse 19, Jesus says, bring the boy to me. So they brought him, in verse 20, they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus then almost casually asked, how long has he been like this? <laughs> The demon's going crazy inside the boy. He's foaming at the mouth. He's rolling all over the ground. There's a large crowd. The father is desperate. He's been arguing with the disciples for some time. His mouth is dry. I mean, it's just not a good scene. And Jesus decides to have a conversation with the father as evil is breaking out. Hey, how, how long has uh, Timmy been like this? The father's a little perplexed here. He's, uh, I, but, well, I mean, since he's been a little boy, actually, Jesus, and the demon, it has tried to kill him. It, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. I mean, this is serious stuff. But if, 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 if you can do anything... Take pity on us and help us. Did anyone catch that word? Did anybody catch what the father said? He used the if word. The if word is a bad word. The if word. He says, if you can if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. How many times have we used the if word with God? If, if, if. Oh, Mary and Martha used it too. If you had only been here sooner, our brother would still be alive. If, if, Lord. If you only did what you said you would do. Now watch Jesus' response in verse 23. I love his response. He says, wait, if you can Hello, if you can, if, if, if I can. <laughs> yeah, you can do anything. I mean, look what's happening to my boy right now. I mean, don't you 
Don't you care? I mean, if you can, do something. If I can. Yes, if you can. If I can. Jesus then does something that's maybe a little snarky. He says, if you can. If you can, if everything is possible for the one who believes. The if is not on God, the if is on us. And it's always been on us. How often does Jesus say, your faith has made you whole? Several weeks ago, remember the woman with the issue of blood? What you believed, woman, your great faith, what you wanted. Jesus never gave permission for power to come out of him, pass through him. Remember, she pickpocketed him. It was her faith that made her whole. I know this is hard for a lot of us to accept, but there are a number of things that do not happen the way we would like them to happen in our life, not because the if is on God, but because the if was on us. I know that's hard to accept. I, I understand that. Now, that doesn't mean your life now is on the wrong path and there's no way to come back. No, 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 no. It just means that some of the things that you asked for were not asked in true faith. Now, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna unpack what that really means, but don't feel bad. I'm not here to tell you you're not a good person because I've been there as well. I'm standing in front of a boy who was lifeless, and I'm telling you, I believe God could if he wanted to. But I didn't like the if on me because it made me too responsible. And I don't want that type of responsibility. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you're willing to follow Jesus, it requires a certain level of responsibility. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. And it will mean that you'll put yourself in precarious situations. It means you'll have to be vulnerable. It means you may have to be more dependent than you feel comfortable with. If I can, Christ says, no, if you can believe, all things are possible for the one who has faith. But the Father does something that just kind of sets this story on another level. Immediately the boy's, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Verse 24, I do believe. Help me over." Come, my unbelief. Oh, that's the right prayer. Ooh, now we're praying about something different. I do believe I have a little bit of faith or I wouldn't be here, Jesus. But what I'm asking you to do feels bigger than my faith. But you can help me have more. Did you know that faith is a gift? Church family, did you know that faith is a gift? Faith is a gift. It is something that we can pray for. It is one of those renewable resources. We can always ask for more faith. Just like water is a renewable resource, faith is. And I'm glad that faith is a renewable resource because sin is a renewable resource. Fear is a renewable resource. Doubt is a renewable resource, and it's always coming at us, so we need faith to also be renewable. God, give me more faith for today. The disciples had to have a measure of faith for Jesus to cast out demons through them, but they begin to wane in their faith. And this is what's really important. So Jesus then, he, he, he hears the, the Father's prayer, and the Bible says that he then saw the crowd running to the scene in verse 25. He rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter again. We'll put a, put, we'll put a pin there. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. The Bible says that the people were shocked by this. Couldn't believe what had happened. This boy now is standing to his feet, alive. As we continue on in chapter 9, verse 28, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? This 
kind of what? This kind can come out only by prayer. Now, some versions say fasting, but that was added. That wasn't in the original Greek. Probably some early church father thought that there needed to be a little bit more hot sauce on this prayer, some more seasoning. Not, not can't just be any kind of prayer because that everybody can pray. Prayer and fasting. It was added later. Some of your versions will have a footnote will let you know that some of the later versions of Mark have that addition. But I believe that Jesus meant it as it is. This can only happen through prayer. Well, that sounds too basic, too plain. But I want you to understand something. Christ is making a statement here. If he tells his disciples why they couldn't do it because they need prayer, that means they tried to cast out demons without prayer. Oh, y'all were filling yourselves after casting out so many demons. He said, hey, bring your boy to us. We got it. You got this Bartholomew? No, I got it, man. You guys back up. Watch, watch a pro. Hey, yo, demon, be gone. <laughs> Didn't work, right? Judas is like, look at that demon going to listen to me. A little foreshadowing. <laughs> that demon going to listen to me. Demon wasn't talking to Judas either, right? They're, they're trying their best. But clearly, they never involve prayer because here's part of the issue. There's, there's three different camps of people when it comes to this subject of prayer. There are those that don't want to pray because they believe they can do it all on their own. Anybody like that here? In fact, the only time you do pray is when you finally realize you can't do it on your own. You won't wake up and pray. You don't talk to the Lord all day. You feel like you can get through life, your relationship, without prayer at all. Do you know the Bible says that Jesus would get up early in the morning just to pray? Just to pray. That's the Son of God. That is God himself, and even he was in need of prayer. And so, so, so Jesus is saying it's, it's a prayer issue. You're not praying. You are so dependent on your past success. And I'm going to tell you something. As a minister, we can fall into this camp. I've been pastoring for a long time. I can do this sometimes with my eyes closed. And I have to be careful because the Spirit sometimes will be leading me to do something different than what I've done in my past. Well, it worked back then. Yeah, it worked back then for a different group of people at a different point in time. I will not write down my entire sermon. I may have like an out, uh, a, kind of like a rough sketch. I may have a, a loose outline, but I never do. I never can preach the exact same sermon because it's different depending on who I'm talking to. And I want to leave room for the Holy Spirit to be able to speak to that congregation. And watch this. Not only does it change for them, it also changes for me. Even this text took on a whole new life, reading it and studying it at this point in my life. I can't be dependent on past successes. It's a new day. And because sin is renewable and fear is renewable and doubt is renewable, faith is must also be renewable. The Holy Spirit is also renewable. Day by day, like fresh morning dew. Jesus is like, no, no, you need prayer. But, but we already prayed like, like a month ago when we cast out all those demons. It, doesn't that work for every? Can't I just say, Lord, just, just save me on the freeway in L.A. Just one time and he'll do it. What's the problem with connecting more regularly? So, pastor, will he not spare me? Will he not save me if I'm on the freeway? All I'm saying is that Jesus said the reason why this didn't happen to their liking is because they didn't pray. Well, how often do I pray? Christ says pray all times. Paul says pray without ceasing. Christ says pray all, all times and never grow discouraged, Luke 18, 1. But when is there a point when I stop praying? Christ never tells us to stop praying. At no point, even Jesus, who came to this earth with one clear mission, the night before his betrayal, I mean, the night of his betrayal and arrest, he's still praying. Is, is there another way? I mean, I, I know what we talked about, Dad. I, I, I know I get it, I get it, I get it. But I'm in need of prayer right now. He tells his disciples, watch and what? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. 
We often don't experience what God intends for us to experience because we don't do it with prayer. We do not have the faith to trust. And faith simply is not just God can do it. Faith is also I put myself in a position and posture of vulnerability to depend on you, Lord. I know that I cannot do it alone. I need you. Only by prayer does this does this happen. And sometimes, let me tell you something, your prayer life doesn't have to be all that elaborate. I don't like when people try to make it formulaic. People will look at the, the, the Lord's Prayer and say, it's, a, it's an outline to pray for an hour every day. Stop it. You're just selling books. Stop. Sometimes prayers are short and sweet. One of the sweetest, shortest prayers in the Bible is, Lord, help. That's Peter on, on the water as he's drowning. Was it a prayer? Absolutely. I talked to a member this week, and she was sharing about having a, a really challenging time, and she said, I, 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 I didn't even know what to say to the Lord. My prayer was simply this, it hurts. Amen. I was like, oh, that's a powerful prayer. That's all her prayer was. It hurts. Amen. Was her prayer heard? Did it matter? Was Jesus listening? Could he empathize? Could Jesus empathize with that prayer? It hurts. Amen. We have to understand that, 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 that this, this, this vehicle of prayer is for us to connect with God, and it has a purpose. And if we believe that all the success we experience in life happens outside of our faith, outside of our experience and relationship with God, we're fooling ourselves. This only happens by prayer. So one camp doesn't want to use God at all to work on it. The other camp wants God to do everything. All things, everything, Lord, everything that I experience in life, all my success, it's all you. It's all you. God never says that. There's no point in, point in Scripture where God says everything you've ever done, everything that has been good, all of it, it's just me, me, me. God has always, the Bible says, looked to partner with people. That's what prayer is about. Prayer is not just listening and prayer is not just talking. It is communication. It is, it, is, it is God speaking to us and us listening, us speaking to God and God listening. It has always been a partnership between man and God. Those who say, it's God, I'm just going to trust on him, I'm just gonna, he's going to do it. If he's going to save our marriage, it's going to be him. If he's going to save my kids, it's just going to be all God. God says, well, actually, it, it's, kind of, it's going to require a little bit of therapy. Hello? It can't be just prayer alone. Well, you know God. You know, I mean, I mean, you, you know, but I mean, I just, I'd rather just depend on you completely. Folk who just want to depend on God solely and add nothing to it are lazy. I don't want to have to put an extra work into that. I, mean, I, just, I just know if, if it's in God's will, it's going to happen. Mm. There's a lot of things that were not in God's will that happened in Scripture. Uh, it started with Eve eating the fruit. Hello? Many things that God allows, which is called his permissive will, but God's perfect will, I'm telling you, 95% of the Bible is God just being permissive. We don't listen. So God is looking for a partnership. He's saying, I'm not expecting you to do it all by yourself, right? That's hedonistic. I don't want you. That, that's Luciferian. It is not you alone. But I'm not asking you to depend on me for everything. Because you know what? If you're depending on the Father for everything, you do not grow. Imagine if I didn't allow my son to ever Place his feet on the ground. I'm going to hold you for the rest of your life. Oh, yes, Lord, hold me for the rest of your life, for the rest of my life. Just hold me, Lord. And, and God just carrying you the entire time. Yeah, just carry me. Remember that poem, Footprints in the Sand? Oh, just carry me, Lord. No, he carries you for portions. But you have to learn to walk on your own. You have to develop those muscles. It is important for you to learn and to trip up and fall. All of that, even failure can be a teacher. We've talked about that before. So prayer involves our successes, our failures. It is a back and forth. And then there's another camp. 
There's one that depends on God wholly. I know, Pastor, Paul says we can do all things. Yeah, Paul says we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. We can do some things on our own. But all things requires God to be a part of the mix, right? So there are those that don't, that don't want to do anything, have God do everything, those who want to do all of it and pretend God does not exist. And then there's this camp, and I want to close on this. This is this camp. The camp that does see prayer as a place of connecting with God. God, I hurt. I do desire these things. My heart, my heart is overwhelmed right now with grief. I'd like you to comfort or I'd like you to heal. I am fearful. I want, I want you to bring me peace. All of those things. But there are those who look at prayer not as a Santa Claus list that they're making and they're wanting God to bless them because they've been good. But that they're looking for the optimum outcome in every situation. They're saying, Lord, this is what I want, this is what I'm feeling, but I understand that you have a better view of the situation, and I am asking for your will to be done. Now, I'll wrestle with you. If that if means I have to roll up my sleeve and fight with you, I'll, I'll do it. But, but we're okay losing because God knows what's best. I need to say this one again. Moses wrestled with God and lost. Moses said, please, let me go to the promised land. Please, please, God said, don't you ask me one more time. Paul said, please remove the thorn from my place. Please, please, please remove the thorn. He says, Paul, my grace is what? There are times that God does say no. There are times he says yes, even when it's not our, in our favor, but he does that even for the, for, the, for the sake of the relationship. He'll do that because we wouldn't understand better, right? Hezekiah, he was just weeping. Give me more years. Give me more years. Wasn't good for Hezekiah. Wasn't good for Israel. But God understood something that was bigger, so he was willing to acquiesce and condescend in that moment. But God always sees the big picture. So Jesus is wrestling with the Father. Is there another way? Is there another way? The Father hears his son's prayers and has to interpret, translate, process, and then do what is best for the son in that moment. And do you know what was best for Jesus in that moment? Jesus couldn't understand in that moment what was absolutely best. If, if, if it were up to him, just depending on his flesh, he may have ran. But he decided to humble himself self and say, not my perspective, not my will, but your will be done. What we need to understand that when we come to God in faith and in prayer, there are some prayer requests that we may make that we really don't want to be answered. Not in the affirmative. Lord, I just, I just... I want this to work out, Lord. This is the person I want to be with. This is the person I'm in love with, Lord. Make it happen. And God goes, ooh, yeah, about that situation. There's something in him that is so broken, and, 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 and your trauma will, will trigger his trauma. And I'm telling you right now, I love him. I'm there for him. I am, I am nurturing him, and, and, and I have someone else for him. It's not you. But Lord, I want it, I want it. Mm, don't twist my arm, girl. I'm telling you, trust me. I wrestled. Lord, bring this boy back to life. Do it for your name's sake. When I left that room, was still dead. What I learned from that experience is that God wasn't wanting to simply use me to parade around how victorious I can be through God's help and the power of God in my life. I learned from that day forward that faith and healing and miracles can happen in different ways. Some situations I walked in, I would know right away that person has to be healed and God wants that person to be healed. I've seen miracles happen, people raised up. We just had a miracle recently in this church. I won't put it out there because that person may not want me to. Was at death's door. Now healthy, whole, and excited and wants to share it with people. That'll be, that'll be that person's story to tell. And we prayed over that person. And we believed that God could do a, a miracle. But there's some situations I've walked into where I felt with the Spirit, we need to be at peace with what's happening right now. 
Lord, your will be done. What I begin to learn in my experience is that even the times that God wasn't coming through for me, in my mind, he was building something bigger, greater. Before ministry, my life was pretty easy. I'm going to be honest with you. Part of a broken family, mom and dad divorced when I was two years old, but I didn't know any better. I had aunts and uncles that were there for me, grandparents, that, 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 that any, any kind of uh, uh, deficit, they filled and then some. It was overflowing. My life was full of love and joy. I got gifts, we got clothes, we had food, all the, all the stuff. I didn't know. I didn't begin to experience real pain and real heartache, real depression. I didn't get to experience that kind of pain where you go to sleep and you say, boy, I wish I didn't wake up in the morning. Until after I was a pastor. Until after being in love. Until after dedicating my life to the Lord. And each moment where I feel like I've been broken down and there is no other way and I, I have failed and all these other things, God keeps building something. Your faith is not going to be measured in how many times God says yes to you. In fact, I would tell you our faith is more measured in the times he says no. Because we learn in these moments, we learn to live with cancer. We learn to live at times with anxiety. We learn to live with that, that disability. We learn to live with divorce. We learn to live with that disease. And there's something in that that is teaching and liberating. The Bible says that Jesus learned perfection through suffering. That's what the book of Hebrews says. He was made perfect by his suffering. Jesus. The prayers that weren't answered, that he's learning in the process. The Bible says that Jesus went to certain towns, his own hometown, and could not perform miracles because of their lack of faith. And it still was an instructional experience. So family, 4K faith, it won't be simply about seeking out the yeses. And accepting only the yeses. Oh, I think you need to fight. I think you need to wrestle. Put God in a headlock if you have to. But just know you may not win that match. But even if you don't win that match, you're still winning. <laughs> That's the beauty of faith. You're still winning. Oh, it might have looked like they were losing in the fiery furnace. It might have looked like they, that he was losing in the lion's den. Mary might have looked like she was losing with all of those demons. And those demons leave and they come back. Those demons leave and they come back. And Jesus says, no, this one with this boy I'm casting out and do not come back. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. It is our responsibility, our responsibility in this space to be able to live with the tension when we hear no. To live with the tension when a demon does come back. We say, but Lord, we cast him out. I know, it's renewable. <laughs> you cast him out. You cast him out last week. I got to cast him out every week with you. It's like that. It's like that. But Lord, you healed her of the cancer. Now the cancer's back? Yeah. You know Lazarus eventually died, right? You know that, right? It comes back. Life keeps coming at you, and life will keep coming at you, but watch this. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Life is coming at you, and God with you together. God is coming at them. Bring on the cross, and in three days, I'll rise again. So church family, how much longer? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. Your grandmother will be healed. My grandmother died too young. I think she died too young. I see grandmothers out there in their 90s. We just laid to rest somebody's mother in their 90s. I'm like, why couldn't my grandmother live to be in her 90s? No fair. My aunt, she's a twin. It's her birthday today. Her brother, 
my Uncle Greg is not here today. That's no fair. It's no fair. God, you should have answered those prayers, but when we see him come in the clouds of glory, his ultimate answer forever and ever will be yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. Those people that, that close their eyes to sleep in Jesus, it will be just a blink for them. They'll say, Lord, Lord, I just want to spend more time with my family, and we want them to live forever, and we want them to be happy forever. That's the ultimate prayer. And Christ says, it's my prayer as well. Peter, I prayed for you. Vallejo Drive, I prayed for you. And his answer will be yes when we see him come in the clouds of glory. That boy who died the day I went to, to pray for him, he had a condition. They didn't think he would live past age one. He was 10. God was answering prayers for 10 years. And when I showed up, God wasn't bailing on me. God wasn't like, oh man, I'm going to make you look bad, son. He was saying, John, it's time. And you are the right person to comfort this family in this moment. That will be the miracle. That will be the answer to prayer. And so I held their hands and I cried with them. And most of my ministry is crying with people. Most of my ministry is comforting people. Most of my ministry is in the know. And I am perfectly situated to do so. I've been through enough that my tears can be real with people in their pain. And it would not have been. So I thank God for the crosses. I thank God for the dark nights. I thank God for those moments because we live in the tension of no so much until we hear yes when he comes in the clouds of glory. Don't you want to be there for that? So we continue to pray and never grow faint. We continue to pray and never grow discouraged. We continue to pray and live in the know. We continue to pray and live in the way. We continue to pray because our hope is that one day he will come through as he promised he would. He loved life for you so much that he died for it. Can you wait in attention with me? Father God, thank you so much for this challenge. It is so difficult at times to deal with the tension of the no's and prayers, to know how our faith works. So Father, we, we right now, wanna, we don't ever want a prayer not to be answered in the affirmative because we didn't have enough faith, because we weren't willing to pray, because we weren't willing to be vulnerable, we weren't willing to wrestle. We'll do that. We'll do our part, knowing that you will do your part. The if is not on you alone, the if is on us. We know that. We accept that. But Father, in the space where there is tension, where we hear the no, we'll trust that you know best. And if it's a cross we must carry, if it's cancer we must bear, if it's a broken relationship we must endure, we know you're not manipulating and controlling it. It's just sin. Sin is a renewable resource. So our faith must be renewable. Our hope must be renewable. And so we submit to you again knowing that one day you will come and say, yes, I do forever. We thank you. How much longer should we wait? As long as it takes, Jesus.